Good day, everyone. On behalf of India Exam Bank, I extend a very warm welcome to all the honorable dignitaries, excellencies, distinguished guests, and all the participants. It is our privilege to have all of you with us at this event, which we are sure shall have some good takeaways for all. This webinar on opportunities for infrastructure development in Rwanda is organized by India Exim Bank to bring together key policy makers of Rwanda and industry stakeholders on both sides to discuss the key policy initiatives of the Rwandan government, particularly in infrastructure development and how Indian businesses could help address infrastructure development and project financing requirements of Rwanda. We have divided this webinar into two sessions. The first session will be on policy framework in Rwanda by key ministries of Rwandan government. And the second session will be an experience sharing session by leading Indian project exporters with a focus on Africa. We will also have a presentation by India Exim Bank on its financing program, Buyer's Credit Under National Export Insurance Account, known as BCNEIA which finances developmental infrastructure projects of overseas sovereign governments or, or their nominated parastatal agencies in developing countries. As we begin the webinar, let me introduce our special guests for today. Honorable Sri Amitabh Kumar, Joint Secretary, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India. Welcome, sir. Honorable Happy. Sri Oscar Kerkita, High Commissioner of India to Rwanda. Welcome, sir. Honorable Mr. Emile Mepisi, Second Counselor, High Commission of Rwanda to India. Welcome, sir. It is indeed an honor to have all of you at this event. May I now request Sri N. Ramesh, Deputy Managing Director, India Exim Bank, for his welcome remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Deepali. Uh, very warm uh, welcome to uh, all the participants. Today we have uh, Sri Amitabh Kumar, Joint Secretary, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, uh, Government of India with us. Uh, His Excellency Sri Haskar so Kerkita. Yeah. Uh, today we have uh, Sri Amitabh Kumar, Joint Secretary, uh, Ministry of Commerce and Industry with us. Uh, Honorable um, His Excellency Sri Askar Kerkita, High Commissioner of India to Rwanda. Uh, Mr. Emile Mepesi, Second Councillor, High Commissioner of uh, Rwanda to India. Honorable Excellencies uh, from the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Infrastructure, Ministry of Trade and Industry, Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning, and Rwanda Development Board, uh, dignitaries on the panel, and distinguished guests. Guess, it's my honor and privilege to welcome you all to India Exim Bank's webinar on opportunities for infrastructure development in Rwanda. Uh, we are meeting uh, through this uh, virtual platform. Uh, we would have hoped this to be uh, a, a, a physical format, but uh, we have been able to uh, bring on a very varied set of uh, Indian exporters and uh, the dignitaries from uh, government of Rwanda in, in this particular webinar. And uh, I need not mention uh, uh, more on the Rwandan economy, which is doing uh, very good uh, uh, despite this uh, COVID-19 uh, Thing, impacting whole of the world, Rwandan economy is, uh, has slightly contracted uh, by about 0.2% in 2020. I think uh, the uh, revival is going to be far better uh, in the Eastern Africa and uh, more so in uh, Rwanda. Uh, for the, before uh, COVID stuck, uh, the growth rate in Rwanda was uh, quite comfortable in the range of 7%. And have, Rwanda has the distinction of ranking uh, being second in the world, World Bank's ease of doing business uh, after Mauritius. So uh, these all uh, features uh, provide us a better opportunity uh, for investment, uh, not only from India, but elsewhere from the world also. The implementation of uh, African Continental Free Trade Area, the AFCFTA program, from 1st of January 2021, that is also provide, providing an opportunity for a pan-African presence being uh, based in uh, Rwanda. So uh, we hope this uh, free trade agreement is going to bring greater benefit to 
Rwanda and all the African nations. Uh, India has a, a long-standing partnership with uh, Rwanda. It is just not on the trade and investment part, but um, uh, the, uh, in fact, Indian Exim Bank's uh, operations also had been uh, towards uh, technology transfer, human resource development, uh, capacity building. So uh, it is a multifaceted involvement. Uh, we, I mean, India has uh, a large value of uh, contracts which are being uh, implemented in Rwanda. In fact, uh, in the last five years, uh, the contracts which were awarded from African Development uh, Bank Indian exporters have uh, a share of 13.1%. Uh, Similarly, in the World Bank projects also, we have a third largest share, uh, about 8.3%. Uh, so there is larger opportunity and Indian uh, exporters are already uh, well placed in the uh, Rwandan economy and had been participating in uh, investment development uh, and had been very critical uh, uh, in uh, Exim Bank has been very critical uh, in this particular uh, investment operations. So this particular uh, uh, programs had also been supported by uh, our regional offices, our overseas offices. Uh, the closest being uh, the Addis Ababa office in Ethiopia. We have two more offices in Johannesburg and Kota uh, Divati, Abidjan. As of uh, end of December 2020, we have uh, around $10.5 billion worth line of credit programs uh, being operated in African nation, African continent, of which uh, Rwanda has nearly seven programs, uh, about $550 million worth projects are being implemented. This range of projects are uh, quite varied, uh, power generation, distribution, irrigation, uh, we are developing some SCZs. Uh, we are developing vocational centers and incubation centers also. A uh, few of the landmark projects are uh, uh, the Nyabarongo hydroelectric power project, which is catering for uh, a good amount of energy requirement of Rwanda. The peat fired power project in Rwanda is one of its kind, uh, which has, uh, which is not only contributing largely to the electric power demand, uh, but also is more economical than the conventional type of uh, power plants there. Apart from this, uh, we have several uh, programs uh, running under the Bias Credit National Export Insurance uh, Account, which is primarily a program of uh, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India. Uh, overall, we have around $2 billion uh, project being uh, implemented in Africa. Not many are in uh, Rwanda. I think uh, through this particular program webinar, we can identify several such opportunities and uh, can develop on few uh, immediate requirements. And then government of India, Exim Bank, the Rwandan government officials, we can all uh, you know, uh, associate and then try to implement these projects at the earliest. The Indian Exim Bank has a consultancy agency by name Kukusa Project Development Company. Uh, we have established uh, this along with African Development Bank. So uh, the uh, Kukuza Development Authority uh, Development Company would also be uh, more than happy to identify such uh, infrastructure projects which, may, which would be beneficial to uh, people of Rwanda. So we have a complete ecosystem of a uh, project development, uh, financing arrangement, and the project implementing agencies. So uh, I hope this particular uh, webinar is going to come out with some actionable and identifiable projects wherein we can play a bigger role. Uh, without taking much time, I would uh, uh, I would um, uh, request uh, the for the program to be carried on and uh, may request uh, Sri Amitabh Kumar, uh, Joint Secretary, to uh, uh, speak uh, give us address. His Excellency, Mr. Oscar Kerkata. Uh, Mr. Emily Mavepsi, uh, Mr. N. Ramesh, Deputy MD uh, in the Indian Exim Bank, uh, and Ms. Shilpa Wagmare. Thank you and good afternoon to all. The COVID-19 pandemic arrived at a moment when growth prospects for many African countries were promising. 
at the beginning of 2020 the continent was on its expansion track with growth projected to rise at around 4% in 2020 and 2021 however with the outbreak of the covid-19 pandemic africa's growth projections were revised downwards according to the imf's world bank economic outlook africa is estimated to recover by 3.7% in 2021 after experiencing an economic contraction of about 2.6% in 2020. While these estimates are rather worrisome, the late entry of the virus into the continent and its past experiences with Ebola and other serious infectious diseases have given African countries the time to learn from other countries' experiences and implement early measures such as limiting or halting air transportation putting in place curfews and even ordering lockdowns before cases started to expand. With the research on vaccines and its rollout plans being set, global economy is expected to recover in 2021. For India as well, with the easing of lockdown restrictions and the pickup in activity, the growth outlook has been upgraded. The IMF estimates the Indian economy to contract by 8% in 2020 before recovering by 11.5% in 2021. Uh, nations including India are at the helm of vaccine research, trials and testing. Today India, has become, uh, to, today, India has not only become the vaccine hub of the world, but has also extended assistance to more than 90 nations requesting doses for stocking up. Uh, Rwanda economic overview. Before experiencing a GDP contraction of 0.2% in 2020, Rwanda was among the six African countries in the top 10 fastest growing economies in the world during 2019, along with Ethiopia and Tanzania in East Africa. Rwanda is projected to rebound at 5.7% in 2021, followed by 6.8% growth in 2022 before returning to its 8% growth trajectory from 2023. Rwanda has a market of over 12 million people with a rapidly growing middle class. In addition, it is also a hub for the rapidly integrating East Africa. Located in the center and bordering four countries in East Africa and being part of EAC common market with a market potential of over 125 million people. Additionally, East, Econ East Africa's economic resilience enhances its prospects to be the continent's growth driver. East African countries remain the most resilient economies, growing at 0.2% during 2020 vis-a-vis -vis the other regions of Africa, which are estimated to contract by the AFDB during the year. According to the AFB estimates, COVID-19 could cost Africa a GDP loss between US dollar 145.5 billion and US dollar 189.7 billion during 2020, depending on the duration of the pandemic. For 2021, the projected GDP losses could vary from US dollar 27.6 billion to US dollar 47 billion from the earlier estimated GDP of US dollar 2.76 trillion without the pandemic. For Africa to avert the economic consequences of COVID-19 and to continue to be on a sustainable growth path, ensuring the flow of finance is critical. However, given the elevated financing needs, the traditional financing mechanism alone may not be sufficient to meet the huge financial needs. The country's existing annual infrastructure financing gap is estimated in the range of about US dollar 68 billion to US dollar 108 billion, which is equivalent to 3 to 5 percent of the continent's GDP. India, uh, India's Exim Bank study has highlighted that inadequate transport infrastructure adds about 30 percent to 40 percent to the costs of goods traded among African countries. India's expertise and experience in PPPs could benefit partner countries in Africa in development of PPP-based infrastructure projects. India's bilateral relations with Rwanda, with a view to facilitate and further enhance bilateral trade and commercial relations with countries in Africa, India has put in place important policy measures as also institutional frameworks to create an enabling trade and business environment. Major policy initiatives and institutional frameworks include, among others, 
focus africa program india's duty free tariff preference scheme for least developed countries which is called dftp for ldc e vidya bharti in tele education e arogya bharti in telemedicine uh, project e vbab then ibsa initiative interbank cooperation among brics members and india africa forum summit india's engagement with rwanda is at three levels namely at the african union level then at the regional economic communities level rec's level and at the bilateral level india's engagement with rwanda has been consultative response based and focused on developing rwandan capacities and human capital although the value the volume of bilateral trade is small bilateral trade has grown significantly during the last 10 years from us dollar 32.5 million during 10/11 to us dollar 128.2 million during 1920 indian companies have made inroads into the rwandan market in areas like infrastructure information and communications technology ict agriculture healthcare and education major items of india's exports to rwanda include pharmaceutical products 21.1% machinery 16% vehicles at 10% and electrical equipment at 9% major imports from rwanda include metallic articles some of which are aluminum lead and copper cumulatively 84% of india's imports from rwanda precious and semi precious stones 8% and tea and coffee at 3% with rwanda randi, uh, ranking the highest among mainland african economies in the ease of doing business rankings it's seen as a good country for investment by indian investors india has emerged as an important investor in rwanda with investments in agriculture and mining about 75% manufacturing about 14% and construction about 1% according to data from the financial times india was the ninth largest investor in rwanda during 2010 to 2019 during the honorable prime minister of india's visit to rwanda in 2018 the honorable pm highlighted on the excellent relations between rwanda and india in the overall context of strategic partnership rwanda is also a member of the international solar alliance isa and it had participated in the founding conference of the isa in march 2018 Rwanda's commitment towards renewable energy is appreciable for its speedy signing and ratification of ISA treaty. Rwanda has also played an important role in fostering regional integration and facilitation of the landmark African Continental Free Trade Area AFCTFA. President Kagame as the African Union chair played an important role in uh, facilitating in finalizing the AFCFTA agreement. India is willing to provide all the necessary support to Rwanda for its successful implementation through physical and digital infrastructure development opportunities with growing impetus to infrastructure projects across most developing countries and multilateral financial institutions scaling up their investments across various infrastructure segments the scale of opportunities in project exports is large and growing Indian exporters can leverage these opportunities as they have already developed substantial competitiveness in this sector. In order to provide further impetus to project imports from India on medium or long term basis, especially in the infrastructure sector, the buyers credit under National Export Insurance Account BC NIA was introduced in April 2011. Under this program, Indian Exim Bank facilitates project exports from India. by way of extending credit facility to overseas sovereign governments and government owned entities for remove or import of goods and services from india on deferred credit terms indian exporters can obtain payment of eligible value from indian exim bank without recourse to them against negotiation of shipping documents any ia is a trust set up by the ministry of commerce and industry and administered by the ecgc limited as on october 1st 2020 a positive list of 21 countries have been identified by ecgc for which indian exporters can avail buyers credit neia of which 37 countries belong to africa and rwanda is one of the countries mentioned in the positive list infrastructure projects suffer from insufficient access to direct investment due to long time horizons complicated project planning and coordination of multiple public and private sector partners making it difficult to structure deals 
the PPP, which is the most suited mode of investment in Africa, still remain a very small market with projects concentrated only in a few countries, such as South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and Uganda. India and Rwanda could collaborate and strengthen their partnership in this direction. If the two countries worked out a system of exchange, a long-term symbiotic relationship could be formed between India and Rwanda. In a nutshell, India and Rwanda share a very special relation. Today, the global economy is facing a health as well as an economic crisis. These testing times certainly pave way for enhancing cooperation to support each other. A stronger India-Rwanda partnership with strategic sector focus such as infrastructure could create a new paradigm for South-South cooperation along with ensuring a more sustainable path to recovery from the pandemic. Thank you. And I wish this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the, both the sessions on policy framework in Rwanda and the experience sharing session by Indian project exporters are helpful to all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. May I now request Honorable Excellency Shri uh, Oscar Kerketa, High Commissioner of India uh, to Rwanda for his address, please, sir. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning because in Rwanda we are still uh, 11 o'clock here and in India it, it's well in the afternoon. So, Joint Secretary, Ministry of Commerce, uh, Ms. Silpa Sathe, Exim Bank, Excellency, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Health, and uh, Ministry of, uh, of uh, uh, Health, uh, Director General, External Finance Division, Min Coffin, distinguished colleagues, colleagues from uh, Ministry of Trade and Industry and RDB, uh, my colleague Emil, Councillor from the High Commission of Rwanda and other uh, distinguished participants. Uh, sitting here, we are very much aware that uh, government of Rwanda is paying utmost attention to infrastructure development. Uh, to my limited uh, personal loan knowledge, I know that uh, currently in the sector of power, there are at least three power projects currently on. There is one peak power project in Gisagara in which Exim Bank of India is involved. Uh, then there is a methane gas power project in Giseni. Then there is also a small uh, hydropower project in Naruguru. And to add to it, there is also a transmission line connecting Ruzomo, Bugesera, Sango. These are my personal in, uh, information, uh, but I'm sure there is much more in the infrastructure going on and in Rwanda and uh, our uh, participants uh, from both RDB and Ministry of Infrastructure would be able uh, uh, to uh, tell us more about it. Currently, I understand there is also a study going on on the development of tertiary roads and there is also a proposal to uh, uh, do the work in the area of navigation in Lake Kivu. We already are aware of the new Bugesera airport being built up, up close to Kigali. Uh, it's uh, going to be a new international airport. There is also a dry port facility which has been set up in Kigali by DP World. Uh, and uh, India has also been associated with the infrastructure development uh, in Rwanda and uh, uh, it's mainly through the lines of credit and uh, 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 Mr. Amitav Kumar has already mentioned, Joint Secretary has mentioned that the LOCs extended to Rwanda are in the various fields of energy, irrigation, special economic zone, vocational training, etc. And these as of now stand at 547 million. They, uh, this is a uh, big uh, infrastructure development taking place in uh, Rwanda, and this is particularly uh, in the case of uh, Bugesera Airport. Bugesera Airport, as the available information, uh, 
the work has already started and the first phase of the airport is to commence in uh, 2022 in uh, next uh, less than two years with 7 million passengers per annum while the second phase of the Bugesera airport is scheduled to be started in 2032 with uh, 14 uh, million passengers per annum. So for an economy like Rwanda, Bugesera airport is going to play a, the role of a catalyst. Once the airport is operational, it's going to offer uh, tremendous opportunities in business spin-off. And in this context, I would like to zero down the possibility of uh, investment in the health sector in Rwanda in conjunction with the Bugesera airport. Because what I understand is that uh, Qatar, which is the main investor as of now in Bugesera airport, plans to use Bugesera airport as the transit hub between Gulf and South America. So if we see this traffic in the context of infrastructure, then it opens up a whole lot of possibilities for business in Rwanda. And investment in the health sector is only one of the possibilities. India is already a go-to destination for medical tourism. Even now, when there is lockdown in uh, uh, Rwanda, a number of uh, high-end medical patients from Rwanda are going to India. They are going, uh, all going to for the high uh, level of medical treatment in India, and on an average, Every day we are issuing at least three medical visas to Rwanda nationals for medical uh, treatment in India. So Bugesera Airport, as I have zeroed down and uh, tried to concentrate only on the medical sector, it offers uh, tremendous opportunities. Bugesera Airport, of course, it will uh, offer multiple opportunities, business opportunities in Rwanda. And as I had already said, medical sector is only one of them. As a matter of fact, Bogesara Airport, like any other place, it will offer a, offer new opportunities in, let's say, uh, transportation, hotel, food and drinks industry, housing, banking, insurance. You can uh, think of anything. Anything which is uh, such a this is going to be such a big catalyst for the uh, Rwandan economy. And why I am saying that uh, uh, health sector investment in Rwanda would be particularly lucrative is because that uh, Rwanda has a good climate. Of course, the, this, claim, this claim is also made by the neighbors of Rwanda like Nairobi and Tanzania. But uh, Rwanda has something more as well. Uh, to attract the medical tourists. It's in terms of very good law and order situation and a very transparent bureaucracy. So these two are also, these institutional uh, issues also would be, uh, uh, like, uh, would be a catalyst for getting uh, medical tourists in Rwanda. And in fact, uh, the uh, proposal or rather the concept of uh, medical uh, tourists uh, in uh, Rwanda um, is not new. The people have been toying with this for a long time, but for some reason or the other, it hasn't uh, taken off. And in case the hospital comes here, uh, which is a multi-speciality hospital, then it will attract the medical tourists, not only from the region, but uh, also from uh, across the globe, from Middle East and South America. So uh, that's the uh, that's the vision one could have. And uh, the hospital uh, would also be uh, uh, sort of uh, a catalyst in its own way, because as a rule of thumb, a multi-specialty hospital with around 200 beds also would provide direct employment to around 1,000 uh, people. So in case the hospital, wherever it's uh, set up, it would provide a backbone to the economy 
of the town in which it's going to be located and uh, direct employment around 1000 people it's a big number uh, so uh, this uh, this is my uh, idea uh, and i would uh, like it uh, like to throw in this idea to the stakeholders from the rwanda as well as also the stakeholders from india to work on this concept in case it's workable then we should uh, why should not we do it because to my understanding uh, as of now there is no big investment in the health sector in rwanda there are some uh, hospitals here uh, but uh, what rwanda really needs as of now and i have been conveyed it at various official levels in uh, rwanda is that Rwanda needs a the good multi-specialty hospital. You have general hospitals like King Fajal hospitals you have. There are also some private hospitals which are also being run by Indians here. Uh, but uh, there is nothing like a multi-specialty hospital here. And the local population needs it, as well as it could also attract uh, the medical tourists. And the hospital could be run on a commercial basis. So what we need is that uh, the setting up of a hospital here, which can be, uh, I mean, which could be catering to a multi, uh, multiple departments, uh, uh, which are not uh, available in Rwanda, like oncology, cardiac, neurosurgery, orthopedics, neuronephrology, gynecology and pediatrics, obesity and diabetology, ophthalmology, and uh, intensive care units for the cardiac as well as well as for the you know, neonatal so uh, what the hospital could be is that uh, for any service for which the rwandan and the regional population needs to go to other places for treatment they could have it here that's the idea and uh, with this i would like it to be considered uh, by the uh, members uh, by the participants of this uh, webinar to give it a thought and in case it's feasible it's agreeable by both sides then it can be pursued and other thing i would like to emphasize that uh, since uh, uh, running of a hospital is both capital intensive as well as technology and uh, skill intensive so in the plan we have to also build in the operation of the hospital uh, for a certain period of time till uh, till 10 or 12 years till the time the Rwanda develops its own at least technical capability in terms of technical manpower whether it's doctor or the paramedics or the other technical personnel to run the hospital and it should be even the operation of the hospital and maintenance of the hospital should be built in the uh, credit program and uh, the this is uh, uh, this is the business proposal in which uh, the money is to be also made. The government of uh, Rwanda would be making money from the day one, even though it might take some time for the hospital project to start breaking even because big projects like uh, this, they don't start paying uh, right from the beginning. So maybe after eight or 10 years, the hospital could start uh, making profit. but it's a long-term uh, uh, strategy for investment this is i would like to say and uh, uh, for the time being i would uh, concentrate uh, only on the hospital thing and uh, i'll give uh, the opportunity uh, to my other colleagues who are participating in this webinar to also aid their ideas about the other uh, sectors where the infrastructure development cooperation could be uh, undertaken between India and Rwanda. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I now request Honorable Mr. Email Mepesi, second counselor, High Commission of Rwanda to India to kindly address the webinar. Um, Sri uh, Amitab Kumar, Joint Secretary, uh, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India. Shri Ramesh, Deputy Managing Director, India Exim Bank. Shri Oscar Kerketa, High Commissioner of India to Rwanda. Ms. Shilpa Wagmare, General Manager, India Exim Bank. Ms. Dipali Sate, Assistant General Manager, India Exim Bank. 
permanent secretaries in various uh, Rwandan ministries, distinguished participants. Namaskar. Mraweza. First of all, uh, Rwanda High Commission uh, thanks the Exim Bank of India to organize such a good forum and give us the opportunity to speak on the opportunities of infrastructure development in Rwanda. Uh, when we talk of opportunities of investment in Rwanda by Indian investors, uh, we think primarily of the excellent relations between the two countries that uh, enjoy a strategic relationship. Our political leaders have uh, laid a strong foundation on which business and investments uh, would sit on. Now, uh, talking of, uh, of uh, opportunities uh, in infrastructure development, Rwanda as a country and integral part of the African continent is undoubtedly uh, offering immense opportunities in infrastructure development. Uh, my presentation uh, will cover five main points that look at the broader perspective of the focal areas that attract infrastructure in Rwanda. Uh, bearing in mind that our Rwandan panelists will tackle the specific sections uh, covered by our government entities. One, uh, Rwanda uh, has a transformational agenda that is found in its main vision instruments that guide the country's direction. The vision uh, 2050, the, the African agenda uh, 2063, the national strategy for transformation that derives its components from the main vision documents. The socioeconomic and governance transformation that Rwanda is doing and aims at on much higher level requires the development of infrastructure, its perfect maintenance for durability. In this line, Rwanda needs and will need to build the human resource capacities. We project a sustainable and quality infrastructure. Therefore, we need quality engineers, drivers of smart concepts and their concretization. Number two, uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the, this health uh, challenge uh, requires medical infrastructure that corroborates Rwanda's vision of having a healthy population. The recent call by His Excellency Paul Kagame during the African Union Bureau and Chairs of Regional Economic Communities meeting understands the establishment of, I thought, a strong, resilient, and sustainable health system, end of course. There's definitely a dire need for necessary medical infrastructure in all manners if we need to curb the, the COVID-19 pandemic and other health challenges in the future. Number three, in its quest to become a modern nation with required standard living of its people, Rwanda continues to seek partnerships in infrastructure development, hard and soft, with a best standard affordable. We, we name airports, roads, water supply, power generation and distribution, railways, internet infrastructure, hospitality, artificial intelligence, and internet of things. All these as enablers uh, to connect Rwanda within and out, continentally and globally. Number four, investment in environmentally uh, friendly infrastructure is key in Rwanda. <coughs> Sorry. The Kigali Amendment of uh, the Montreal Protocol makes Rwanda one of the parties to the protocol with rights and obligations towards the preservation of the nature. <coughs> The new technologies are required for environment impact assessments while putting architecture, while putting up architecture structures and activities presenting risks of deleterious gas emissions, which are detrimental to the global climate. Number five and last, 
none can imagine the development of infrastructure without thinking of basic need for research and development. Rwanda promotes science and technology, and we need cutting edge research and the experimental facilities to innovate and create new solutions for new challenges in sectors of health, agriculture, financial management, quality food production, ICT, real estates, mining, resource management, and anti-corruption mechanisms. In brief, there is plenty of opportunities for infrastructure development in the country, and the mobilization of funds is key and should be done in a viable way that enables the borrowers to service their loans with less financial burdens. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, sir. It was indeed an insightful uh, interest. We move on to the next uh, India Exim Bank presentation. As part of India Exim Bank's efforts to engage with new emerging markets for boosting Indian project exports and to cater to the growing infrastructure financing needs of developing countries like Rwanda, India Exim Bank shall now give a presentation to discuss its unique finance program, which has comprehensive risk insurance from ECGC Limited called the Bias Credit and the National Export Insurance Account, which supports bankable infrastructure projects which that are backed by sovereign guarantees of, uh, uh, guarantee of the overseas governments and has already been successfully extended to many African countries as already has been uh, as already covered. So may I now call upon Ms. Shilpa Wagmare, General Manager, India Exim Bank, to take us through this presentation. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, very good morning and good afternoon to honorable dignitaries and distinguished guests. I'll just share my screen. So in today's presentation, uh, I'll be giving an overview uh, on India Exim Bank, following which I'll be speaking on India Exim Bank's bias credit and the national export insurance account program. Moving to a brief on India Exim Bank. India Exim Bank was set up so India Exim Bank was set up under the Act of Parliament in 1981 by Government of India and is 100% owned by Government of India. It is India's official export credit agency and it plays a very important role in formulation of policy and export project selection. The policy business such as the lines of credit program, concession financing, financing scheme and bias credit under NEI is guaranteed by sovereign governments. Over the years, India Exim Bank's vision has evolved from a product centric approach to a customer centric approach. From being set up to provide export credits in 1982, India Exim Bank today provides a comprehensive range of products and services supporting all stages of the export business cycle. As highlighted by our Deputy Managing Director, this slide represents India Exim Bank's presence in Rwanda in one of the notable projects. Under the Government of India's Lines of Credit program, India Exim Bank supported the 28 megawatt Nyaborongo hydropower project in Rwanda. The project is one of Rwanda's biggest hydroelectric power plant and caters to 25% of the total electricity requirements of Rwanda. In this picture, Exim Bank has supported a special purpose vehicle for developing a 70 megawatt peat fired power project. The peat fired power project is expected to be 35 to 40% more economical than other conventional sources of power. I will now be sharing a short video of this project. This is our Managing Director, Mr. David Raskina.
yeah i hope you like the video now moving to the next section of my presentation giving a brief on the bias credit under nei program i quickly run through the presentation as most of it is had already been covered by honorable dignitaries to give an overall picture india exim bank has sanctioned an aggregate amount of usd 2.65 billion for 30 projects valued to usd 2.88 billion in africa itself bank has sanctioned an aggregate amount of usd 2 billion for 21 projects valued at usd 2.2 billion including ghana cameroon zambia senegal mauritania codevo kenya tanzania mozambique and uganda in terms of region bank has about 76% exposure in africa with largest exposure being in west africa as you see bank's present exposure in east africa is 5% only as mentioned by the honorable dignitary since there is a lot of potential in east africa particularly rwanda which remains untapped there is a need to expand the outreach of this program to to this region as well now moving to the genesis of the program in order to provide impetus to project exports from india exim bank in conjunction with ecgc introduced bcna program in april 2011 the bcna program provides extended tenor credit directly to a foreign government and to a foreign parastatal entity backed by the sovereign guarantee of that country's government on tenor linked rates of interest and comprehensive risk cover from nei trust the program enables the indian project exporters to enter into the competitive international market for executing complex projects overseas in timely and competent manner it also enables the overseas sovereign governments and the nominated government owned entities for financing their import of eligible goods and services from india on deferred payment basis in a nutshell bcnei is a unique program that provides a safe mode of non recourse financing option to indian project exporters and serves as an effective market entry tool to a traditional as well as new markets in developing countries which need deferred credit on medium to long term basis moving to the salient features of this program as i mentioned earlier eligible borrowers would be sovereign governments and nominated government owned entities the objective of the program is to finance imports of eligible project exports supply and services from india on deferred payment basis eligible goods and services would include civil construction turnkey consultancy services supplies etc from india quantum would generally be 85% of the contract value interest would be tenor link pricing and minimum indian content would be 75% of the credit facility the nei insurance premium for the issuance of nei's comprehensive risk cover policy is borne by borrower or indian exporter as may be mutually agreed the premium is determined as per ecgc country rating period of credit would usually be 8 to 20 years with up to 8 years for supply contracts as regards security apart from nei insurance cover security includes sovereign guarantee of the country where the borrower is other than the ministry of finance of the borrower government now moving to the process flow chart the indian project exporter which is being referred to as ip here approaches india exim bank for issuance of indicative term sheet that is its as a part of preliminary due diligence india exim bank will assess whether the ip has the general experience of executing the contracts in india and specific experience of execution of similar projects of determined value as a prime contractor in india or overseas that have been satisfactorily completed further whether the country is included in the positive list of countries as per ecgc whether enough headroom for nei insurance cover is available etc normally ip is with satisfactory track record sound financials and a good repute are considered for support under the bcna program after satisfying the preliminary criteria the its is issued the borrower conveys its acceptance to the its and thereafter the contract is signed between the indian exporter and the borrower government the borrower makes a request for assistance by forwarding a copy of the contract after internal due diligence and a detailed appraisal india exim bank obtains internal approval from its competent authority it then recommends the proposal through ecgc to the committee of directions that is cod which is a high powered committee set up by the ministry of commerce government of india for providing nei cover based on the merits of the proposal cod accords its approval for the cover to india exim bank the sanction is conveyed to the borrower government and the draft agreement along with the term sheet 
is shared post which the nei agreement is signed between india exim bank and the borrower government now moving to the nature of projects covered under the program generally the projects covering sectors where ips have established expertise would be covered for support under the program such as power railways roads vehicles capital goods housing hospitals and related civil infrastructure water etc however this list is not exhaustive and may be suitably expanded from time to time moving to some of our success stories these are some of the sectors which have been supported by india exim bank supply of offshore petrol vessels in sri lanka water treatment and distribution project in sri lanka decongestion project in zambia and road development project in maldives supply of vehicles in senegal codevor and tanzania lpg storage and bottling facility in mozambique transmission and distribution power project in senegal and mauritania railway project in ghana uh today we all know that uh, healthcare has taken a prime stage in every nation's developmental agenda as mentioned by excellencies there lies immense opportunities to strengthen india rwanda partnerships through infrastructure projects particularly those in the healthcare sector such as multi speciality hospitals such projects may be financed under bcne program so this was all about bcne program Uh, i'm happy to announce that today india exim bank is launching its new booklet on bcna program covering its success stories the booklet will be emailed to all the participants and will also be uploaded on our website eximbankindia.in if you have any queries related to this program we shall be happy to take them at the end of the session thank you very much i will also share with you the links of the booklet this is a booklet uh, which will be launching today so this covers all our success stories and also gives uh, the information on the positive list of countries uh, which have been uh, identified by ecgc and the uh, schedule of charges uh, to be borne by the indian project exporter uh, including the nei insurance premium to be borne by the exporter as well as uh, borrower thank you everyone thank you ma'am may i now request nehal to take over the session one uh, coordinating please thank you dipali uh, we now begin with the first session of this webinar which is session on policy framework in rwanda this session will primarily focus on the policy intervention for infrastructure development in rwanda we have dignitaries from the ministry of health ministry of infrastructure ministry of trade and industry ministry of finance and economic planning as well as the rwanda development board we now call upon our first speaker for this session mr zaki yakaremi permanent secretary ministry of health government of rwanda sir over to you thank you very much excellencies distinguished delegates uh, ladies and gentlemen ladies and gentlemen good morning and uh, good afternoon if you are in Indi in india um i'm pleased to be joining this forum today um as uh, it is an important occasion for us as the health sector to discuss uh, different opportunities for rwanda and india to cooperate in the area of uh, health infrastructure development uh, and uh, it is actually even the light time when we are all facing the consequences from the covid-19 pandemic uh, whereby experience has shown that um, uh, having a well developed infrastructure is very critical for us to be able to respond to the pandemic uh, efficiently um as you all know we with this pandemic 
uh, different countries have uh, taken um, uh, different approaches, policies, intervention to contain the pandemic. And Rwanda, as a country, has also uh, joined the, the global uh, struggle to fight the pandemic. Currently, we have uh, tried to increase our capacity uh, to, to respond to the pandemic in terms of prevention, but also in terms of treatment, we, uh, as well as testing capacity. So currently, we, we have enough testing capacity as Rwanda. We also uh, have enough capacity uh, in terms of uh, beds, uh, like ICU beds, so that we are sure uh, and we have a good plan for the rollout of the, the, the vaccine. So we are sure with uh, existing efforts as well as new efforts to come in, we shall surely be able uh, to contain the pandemic. And if all goes well, our, uh, uh, we, we shall come back to our normal life soon. So um, now coming back to, to the session about uh, opportunities for infrastructure development in the health sector. Uh, uh, I think um, uh, Emil, the first, the second councillor of uh, one commission, high commission in India, has uh, uh, typed uh, on uh, most of the the areas. Uh, and as you know, Rwanda, one and vision is to become a middle income country by 2050. Uh, and uh, for us to become there, a middle income country by 2050. It requires certainly a development of accessible and sustainable modern infrastructure and livelihoods. So this discussion today is surely aligned to the government version, vision and, uh, and is going to help us to move to, towards that uh, final destination of turning our country into a middle income country and uh, with modern and sustainable infrastructure. Excellencies, uh, the run and health sector, we, we are implementing several infrastructure and uh, livelihoods intervention to contribute to the realization of the country vision 2050. Uh, and uh, some of the infrastructure related priority areas that I would like to discuss today in this forum are of three categories. The first category uh, are interventions related to construction and upgrading uh, of public health facilities with adequate and modern uh, uh, equipment uh, in terms uh, for us to be able to respond to various pandemics as well as uh, uh, non-communicable diseases. So over the last two decades, Rwanda has made uh, important progress toward improving the infra geographical accessibility to primary health care uh, through network of community workers you know, our, our Rwandan health sector is uh, built from the local community, where at the lowest level we have community health workers. Uh, we have health posts. Now this is a health facility. And then from the health uh, post, we go up to the health center, which has, uh, has a, a package of health services that it offers. And we also have district hospitals. From district hospitals, we have uh, provincial hospitals different hospitals and then a uh, university teaching hospitals. This is the hierarchy of our health system in terms of uh, uh, health facilities. So we have been able uh, to stabilize some of the, 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 the service chain from the community health workers, uh, establishment of the health post at the primary health care level, as well as construction and upgrading uh, health centers. We have a number of health centers, new, new as well as existing health centers. But uh, we, st we still need to sustain the gains in geographic accessibility uh, by further improving the primary health care services, as well as to prioritize, improve, uh, and uh, to prioritize uh, access to specialized health services, which is delivered to a uh, secondary and tertiary level of care. So at secondary, uh, level of care, we have 38 district hospitals, which need to be actually modernized so that they can have a, a required infrastructure as well as equipment to be able to deliver adequate and efficient health services. Now at um, tertiary level, we have four provincial hospitals and the eight referral hospitals, 
all of them need uh, ultra modern to be modernized and become ultra modern hospitals uh, suitable to not only serve the run and population but as um, uh, has been highlighted to also become help support Rwanda Rwanda intention to become a regional uh, hub for medical tourism so if we can uh, up upgrade the um, the specialized hospitals uh, provincial and referral hospitals this is only when we can be able to attract uh, um, our regional uh, members to, to become uh, to run uh, for medical tourism, but to, as well as reducing uh, where possible uh, transfers abroad uh, for uh, cases where we can treat here in Rwanda through just investing in our existing hospitals or even thinking through uh, improving uh, and uh, commencing the new uh, hospitals. So the second category of infrastructure development project that I would want to introduce to you here in this forum is if we can explore opportunities of partnering with the private sector. And I think it has been said uh, that um, by uh, His Excellency, the High Commissioner of India to Rwanda has mentioned the, and provided a lot, of, a lot of details of opportunities whereby uh, the private sector can be involved to partner with public in terms of public-private part, uh, partnership to set up centers of excellence in the country for treatment of non-communicable disease that are currently requiring treatment abroad, including uh, cancers, cardiac surgery, complex trauma, and many more, like he mentioned a long list of where today we are only relying on transfer abroad. And uh, I have to, uh, to say, that even when you look at what we are transferring abroad, more than 90% is actually going uh, to India, like uh, Your Excellency, the High Commissioner of India to Rwanda, you rightly mentioned. So the private, uh, uh, private or public uh, private uh, health centers of excellence is a key uh, area where we can partner in terms of promoting investment into the health sector so that we can have a center of excellence that issue a high specialized health services uh, that would help us to reduce the, the unnecessary transfer abroad, but as well as attracting uh, the regional and why not global even uh, medical tourism to come to Rwanda as a, a final tour medical tourism destination. So uh, the third three, Rwandan health sector is also interested in promoting industries in pharmaceuticals, uh, and manufacturing of medical equipment, as well as uh, medical research. Uh, I think uh, uh, our second councillor of High Commissioner of Rwanda in India has rightly mentioned about the need for research, and medical research is actually very critical during this time of COVID and the other emerging pandemics. So if we can even build more on Indian expertise in the health sector and be able to tap in investment into the health research, I think we would be able to, to have a, a very useful results in this area. So we, we, we believe uh, if we can partner with India uh, in promoting industry in pharmaceuticals, manufacturing of medical equipment, at, as well as uh, medical research, that would be uh, very much uh, important. And with the other existing and ongoing infrastructure investment like uh, we are mentioning the Bujasela International Airport, which would actually help to, to even target more regions uh, to, uh, to attract them to, to the investment. So uh, we, we, would, we are very willing to attract and support pharmaceutical and biomedical companies and industries through sector-specific interventions to enhance their competitiveness and expression, technology, acquisition, and upgrading. Uh, uh, I think those are um, main areas where we think we we can uh, <coughs> we, we, we can uh, we can partner with uh, India Exim Bank and the uh, Indian people uh, through their knowledge and the expertise in the health interventions and the, 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 those will actually facilitate us in terms of reaching our our uh, interventions and the targets in the the 
our vision 2050. So upgrading and improving, modernizing public hospitals uh, at all the levels, uh, but more specifically focusing at uh, the tertiary level, those specialized services uh, is an, a key area. Uh, attracting private sector in supporting government in achieving goals to, of making a regional uh, Rwanda a medical regional tourism hub is very important area that we can partner all of us. Um, as well as uh, reducing Rwanda and reliance on medical products and medicines importation by attracting and promoting pharmaceuticals and biomedical companies uh, here to Rwanda. I think uh, mentioned about uh, the, the, the special economic zone that we have, those, those are areas that are reserved for companies that can come and invest in Rwanda. And uh, he, 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 my colleagues from RDB and Milcom, we might talk about the, the existing incentives uh, that uh, as Rwanda, as a country, are providing to investors. And uh, those are the benefits and incentives that can be benefited from the, the, the companies and the people who would want to invest here in uh, our uh, pharmaceutical companies. Well, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I believe that those are the three critical areas that should be of our focus while establishing new partnership of health infrastructure development. Uh, and for specific project, I think we can uh, always get in touch um, and through uh, probably the coordination of the Minister of Finance, which coordinates us, our contact with the uh, with the, the Exim uh, Bank of India, and uh, we can try and identify specific projects in those three areas that I mentioned of our interest. I thank you, Your Excellencies. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your valuable insights. Uh, it was indeed holistic in terms of developing Rwanda into a healthcare hub not only in terms of hospitals, but also medical equipments, as well as uh, medical tourism. Uh, may I now call upon Ms. Patrici Uwasi, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Infrastructure, Government of Rwanda, to deliver her address. Madam, over to you. Thank you very much, Madam. Uh, good afternoon uh, to participants in India. Good morning to the ones in Rwanda. Uh, this is indeed a great opportunity, as was said by the previous speaker, for us uh, to discuss with the Exim Bank of India, as well as the other participants on this call, and uh, really deepen our partnerships uh, going forward. I won't go back to the many other projects that were already um, shown, even in the video that we've uh, successfully carried out with Exim India. And so it's our hope and really um, pleasure to continue this partnership and, and really bear more fruits going forward. I'll give you a quick overview of the infrastructure sector to um, help the participants today get a context, the context of the infrastructure sector in Rwanda. And uh, then I'll go through some of the projects or investment opportunities that I think uh, partners in India could definitely come into. And um, then again, like you said, I will be happy to answer any questions that come up. So first of all, just to give you context, uh, before the pandemic that hit the world, Rwanda was on a really steep growth uh, path with about, uh, on average, 8% uh, GDP growth on annual basis. Uh, the target has been that um, by 2032, when our population has grown from the 12 million that was earlier mentioned, when we are about 17 million, we can service uh, both this growth and the region much better using advanced infrastructure. Also, uh, more on context, uh, the Ministry of Infrastructure oversees about four major sectors of the, of the economy in Rwanda, one of them being housing. And uh, today, uh, just to also give you context, uh, the households uh, in Rwanda living in planned settlements stand at 61.7%. And our target is to improve this so that by uh, 2024, in about uh, three years, we are at 80% plant settlements. The other good indicator for housing is the population living in urban areas, uh, currently standing at about 18% from the latest uh, survey. Um, 
would like to now increase that and uh, almost double it to 35% by 2024. There's multiple initiatives already ongoing to uh, achieve that target, but there's also many more opportunities really to, to push us towards um, uh, 2024 targets of uh, 35%. In the second area that we oversee, that's uh, water and sanitation, uh, we one of the major targets that we have is to ensure that uh, there's universal access to water supply services, a clean water supply, uh, by all the inhabitants of Rwanda. And that uh, today stands at uh, about 87.4%. So the target is that by uh, 2024, 100% of the population in Rwanda has access to clean drinking water. This also goes hand in hand with the sanitation services, of course. Uh, we currently stand at about 86%, and our target is to ensure that by 2024, there's universal access to sanitation services. The third uh, sector, major sector that we oversee is um, power, energy. You already talked about the project we're currently uh, uh, about to complete, uh, the pit fired uh, power plant uh, in the southern part of Rwanda. There's many more other um, projects going on currently. Uh, our generation efforts really do need um, uh, to be bumped up, and uh, we appreciate the partnership we've had with the, the India Agri Bank so far. But uh, we currently uh, uh, stand at about only 228 megawatts. So our target is to grow this generation capacity to about 556 megawatts by 2024. And so there's also there uh, really interesting opportunities for investments. Currently, the uh, access to electricity in Rwanda stands at about 57%. Uh, the latest published number is 52%. But again, here, the other target we have is to ensure universal access to electricity services by 2024. So we've got really ambitious targets, and uh, that's the reason we are always uh, happy to have partners like yourselves join us on this journey. The fourth and the uh, last uh, sector we oversee uh, here is uh, transportation, transport infrastructure. And uh, here, some of the contextual indicators, just for you to understand where we stand, uh, we look at uh, what um, uh, kilometers, number of kilometers we have paved, and uh, we currently stand at about 2,000 only. Our target is to grow this number to about 2.6 uh, thousand uh, by 2024. Large uh, road infrastructure projects um, really available for investment on this side. There's also the target for us to ensure that whatever infrastructure we have in place is well maintained and operational. And we currently stand at about 96% of the national uh, paved roads well maintained in, in good condition. Our target has always been to ensure that this is maintained at about 97, 98%. So there's also lots of opportunities for road maintenance um, projects here. The other uh, indicator we always look at here is um, how we serve uh, the population um, when it comes to public transportation. And I saw that you also finance some projects for buses. Yes, we do also look at these indicators. We currently stand at about 30 minutes waiting time for, um, for the you know, people on average waiting for buses. So our target is to ensure that this number really reduces to about 15 minutes by 2024. And again, like I said, there's lots of uh, opportunities there for private sector um, investments. That is just the context for, for the sector in general. And now I'll touch a bit about uh, some of the investments we have, if you're allowed. Um, here, um, I'll go maybe just to some I think that are really exciting. Uh, we're currently working on projects with the World Bank for informal settlement upgrading and uh, property development. And so there's multiple projects we've got just for the city of Kigali to, to develop um, and upgrade some of our informal settlements. Like I said earlier, our target is to ensure that by 2024, 80% of, of the households are in planned settlements. We also have opportunities across the country in what we call secondary cities. And these are all geared towards um, first developing housing, but also ensuring that uh, the informal settlements that exist in those places are actually upgraded uh, to match our vision. There's also opportunities for affordable housing development. We have a fund uh, funded by the World Bank currently 
about a standing at about 150 million US dollars just to ensure we boost um, the, 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 the really this sector because we've been working on the sector for some time now and there's not much uh, development that has been made. So with the World Bank Fund, we've, uh, we've locked in uh, funds just to ensure that affordable housing projects can be developed in the city of Kigali, but also in the other secondary cities I mentioned earlier. We have about 23 projects lined up, ready for financing. There's also opportunities in transportation, like at the estate, and uh, here there's, uh, for example, a uh, new development we have uh, for water transportation. And so there's the acquisition and operation of ferries uh, on the lake, the, the lake we share with, uh, with, with some neighboring country, the Lake Kivu, it's a large lake, and we see a lot of opportunities there. There's, of course, uh, the railroad that will connect us to the port of Mombasa. So the, the, the part that we're currently uh, looking at is the Dar Isaka Kigali railway project. And uh, there's also um, in the future construction for uh, rapid transit for the city of Kigali. In general, those are the opportunities we have. But again, like I said, there's multiple more, and we'll be happy to discuss with you uh, going forward should uh, you have any interest in any of the projects I mentioned. Thank you very much for your attention. Over back to you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam, for your insights on the key infrastructure sectors broadly covering health, uh, broadly covering housing, power, uh, water and sanitation, as well as roads and infrastructure. Uh, we were uh, actually uh, enlightened by the broad aspects of infrastructure which have opportunities for Indian project exporters. Uh, thank you, Madam, for your insights. I would now like to call upon our next speaker, Mr. Gerald Mugabe. Director General, Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning, Government of Rwanda. Sir, over to you. Uh, good morning uh, and good afternoon for, uh, for people who are in India. Um, your, your Excellency, um, Joint Secretary from Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India, Excellency uh, High Commissioner of India in Rwanda, and uh, um, Mr. Emil uh, from our High Commission in India, uh, team from Exim Bank of India, and the Government of Rwanda representative. Uh, thank you for organizing this. Uh, thank you for organizing uh, uh, this important meeting with the, uh, us here uh, to discuss about the uh, infrastructure opportunities in Rwanda. And um, in terms of context, my colleagues have really um, gone in, uh, in, into the details uh, from our um, Mr. Emil uh, uh, elaborated more in terms of our context uh, from Vision 2050 to our national strategy uh, for transformation, but also here in the context of COVID-19, um, we have our economic recovery plan, uh, which uh, prioritizes uh, different infrastructures, um, including digital infrastructure, um, in many areas, we've seen that in uh, during this pandemic, uh, there are um, countries with uh, good infrastructures have been able to respond, um, health infrastructure. So this is opportunity for us um, to explore and discuss with the um, team from the Exim Bank of India on how we can. Um, uh, go in details and see uh, the opportunities of the projects that can uh, we can uh, start and develop. Um, uh, I can't uh, uh, stop to thank the Exim Bank for the projects that we've already uh, cooperated um, on in, in, in different areas in in the energy. You mentioned the uh, Nyabarongo hydropower plant. The 
uh, projects in agriculture, especially the irrigation, export targeted irrigation, um, um, in industrial parks, special economic zone, and also in technical and vocational education. Um, all those areas um, uh, are still areas of interest for us, and I believe uh, we could uh, benefit and uh, um, leverage this partnership and expand in those areas um, in terms of infrastructure development. Um, the other thing um, that I also wanted to mention um, in terms of exploring new opportunities in infrastructure development is to focus on areas uh, where India is known for um, great expertise and experience. Um, our um, the peers from Ministry of Health mentioned it and they elaborated more how uh, I think this we can we can explore this partnership in the health sector. This is a very important sector to us, and we know uh, that India has um, enough experience and expertise. And this can, um, through the partnership with the Exim Bank of India and generally with the government of India, we believe that we can develop a project that uh, can respond to the needs, um, whether uh, to the needs of the um, our patients here who travel um, to look for uh, medical services abroad, especially in India, but also to attract uh, people in the region uh, to benefit from such services uh, from here. So this is an area that we are interested to uh, uh, work with you and uh, uh, de define a project that we can design uh, which can help to respond to those needs. Um, and this all again comes to the uh, to the context of the finan financing from Exim Bank of India, um, especially on the requirement of the 75% uh, of the Indian content. So, so the, uh, we, uh, our interest would be in those areas where uh, uh, we can easily have a project that can fit that context, and I believe. Um, we can explore. So the other thing, uh, I think PS Ministry of Infrastructure mentioned the, uh, a lot of areas in, in infrastructure that we can cooperate with you, uh, whether it is in water and sanitation, uh, sewage system, waste management, in electricity, uh, especially in electricity we have um, there is a good experience of working with Exim Bank in that field. Uh, there are pipeline of projects that we are discussing but I believe we can do more in that area and also in the transport um, railway uh, we're trying to connect um, with the, uh, the 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 Indian Ocean uh, so different corridors so i believe this could be one of the areas that we can also to uh, explore especially using um, combination of ppp and the concession of financing from exim bank of india so um i think my colleagues touched most of the areas and uh, um what I can say, we, we are ready to work with you uh, on the next steps, um, how we can uh, go into specific projects um, for implementation. I thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir for your insights and primarily on mentioning how PPP as well as concessional financing is going to support infrastructure in Rwanda. I would now like to call upon Mr. Philippe Lucky, Head of Investment Marketing Department, Rwanda Development Board, Government of Rwanda. Sir, over to you. Mr. 
Manura Angabo, Jonas, the Chief Technical Officer, Ministry of Trade and Industry, Government of Rwanda. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellencies. Uh, I think uh, this is really a very wonderful discussion. I've been uh, following up and um, really join my colleagues to really thank the organizers of this uh, session. And uh, it's really timely. This is a good time for us to discuss uh, these uh, opportunities. Um, I, I won't go back to uh some of the element that have been already highlighted i will go straight forward to uh, some areas of uh, uh of interest uh, as far as trade and industry is concerned especially uh, on industry as you are aware the minister of trade and industry uh of course the whole government of rwanda have uh, developed what we call special economic zone policy uh, this is in line with the, the overall uh, objectives of uh, promoting industrialization in Rwanda. Um, with that, we earmarked around uh, nine industrial parks, of which we plan to develop over uh, the next years, uh, aligned with the National uh, Vision 2050, uh, which aims at uh, uh helping rwanda to become a middle-income country by 2035 uh, but also high-income country by 2050. we do understand that uh, this will be uh, heavily driven by the private sector development as well as uh, industrialization so um, to make that uh, happen we believe that infrastructure plays a key role uh, in enabling uh, business and, and, and creating that conducive environment uh, to invest. Uh, uh, we, this is what we call uh, infrastructure for growth. So one of the infrastructure for growth uh, includes um, service the land. Service land means you have uh, good roads, uh, you have, um, I mean, electricity, you have water, you have uh, uh, also internet connectivity, all of these to the industrial areas. So with the nine earmarked industrial areas, uh, we appreciate already the ongoing discussion and initiatives to partner with the Indian Exim Bank on two of them. This is uh, one which is called Ramagana and the other one called Vigesera Industrial Parks. To develop them, uh, I think we are at advanced level to really uh, come up with, with a, a operationalization of, of, of this support, uh, which we think by as soon as possible we'll have concrete examples as we finalize a discussion from both sides. And having said this, we still have a number of um, remaining uh, industrial parks or special economic zone that we have recently adopted um, a mechanism to develop them through public-private partnership. Uh, given the heavy investment, but also the importance of this project, we do believe that there is urgency, but also high pressing demand from the private sector, uh, I mean, wanting to really access this service land. Uh, but since they are not yet ready, we think that uh, looking for ways to partner with the private sector is really a, a key um, strategy to make it happen. For the remaining seven industrial parks, we have recently conducted a study to look at the four of them. How can we adopt a PPP model uh, to attract investors so that they can invest in development of those industrial parks? The way these industrial parks are located, uh, they're actually aligned with our urbanization uh, strategy. I think uh, PS from the Ministry of Infrastructure uh, may have alluded to that. Uh, every secondary cities, it's not only in Kigali. Yes, we have one in Kigali, 
but the rest also are located in different parts of the country. And some of them with the proximity with the neighboring country like DRC, uh, where when you look at uh, uh, the market for um, manufacturing, agro-processing products, so th these are really very uh, great uh, opportunity that we really need to tap into. So we have, uh, among those, we have Musanze Industrial Parks, which is under the PPP approach, which we are mobilizing investors and attracting them to come and partner with the government. We have also Rubavu uh, with the border with the Democratic Republic of Congo. We have Rusiz, again, the other side of the border with the Bukavu, that is the uh, uh, also, uh, with the border with Democratic Republic of Congo, we have Huye, southern part of Rwanda, and um, uh, we have also Muhanga in the middle of the country, uh, and also Nyagetare in the eastern uh, province. So we, with the four, which are the pride of now, it's um, Musanze and Rusizi, as well as Huye. And and um, and Muhanga, which we have recently um, conducted a study to look at how we, we can now start attracting investors. So uh, very soon through RDB, these um, business opportunities will be availed, and we'll uh, launch call for proposals or call for uh, expression of interest, of which we think, since also with the Indian Exim Bank, uh, we are going to be developing the two ones. We think that uh, leveraging on that already prior experience that is ongoing, uh, Indian business people also could benefit or also be attracted to this industrial park as well. So why industrial park? At the end of the day, we are looking at uh, uh, connecting all the initiatives and incentives that the government has provided. I think through RDB, they also have an opportunity to talk about it, we still need to really on the ground, uh, making sure that uh, the infrastructure there also uh, supports in the overarching strategy of attracting be it foreign investors, but also local investors at the same time. So we do believe that uh, availing those facilities uh, and since uh, as, as per now, some of the industrial park already are being booked this is an indication that uh, there is high demand of this land. Uh, looking at Rua Magana, it's already booked. Looking at Buyesera, phase one is already booked. The other two phases already we have demand on our tables here. We are saying, oh, look, wait a little bit so that we put all the infrastructure before you, you book this land. So for us, we are seeing that uh, it's really a good opportunity that we need to tap into and partnering with investors. So having said this, uh, we have already documentation which will avail as we launch um, the call for uh, expression of interest, which we think uh, this again will contribute to the overall goal as, uh, as it is stipulated in our national strategy for transformation, uh, our private sector-led economy, but also job creation as well. As you know, we have a target of creating 1.5 million jobs by end of 2024, which we think also this uh, infrastructure for growth will contribute significantly. As you know, also I think infrastructure construction is contributing around, it's actually the first contributor to job creation. And we think it, this is uh, among the priority projects that the government is putting forward uh, to partner with the private sector and make uh, them uh, realized. So we welcome uh, all business partners who would be uh, interested to partner with the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And we uh, really appreciate also this opportunity and we are very happy to share any further information and further clarification on what we can work together and, and, and make it happen. So thank you so much for the organizers. I really appreciate this opportunity uh, given to us. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your insights on uh, the investment post prospects and potentials in industrial parks in Rwanda. Uh, may I now call upon Mr. Philippe Lucky, 
head of investment marketing and department rwanda development board government of rwanda so if you may please unmute yourself again i just want to really take this opportunity to thank you the organizers for really engaging us and for organizing this session showcase the infrastructure opportunities in rwanda i think a lot has been said i don't want to go into what my colleagues have already mentioned in the interest of time but one particular area that i would really like to highlight and perhaps to all the participants on this webinar is to kind of shed more light on you know the business environment because the opportunities have already been highlighted from infrastructure to medical tourism industrial park development but for an, an indian investor who's looking to come to rwanda to start their own business what expectations are they going to get on ground when they really want to get the ball rolling so allow me shed more light on this first you may have noticed that rwanda has created a very enabling and conducive environment for doing business in the country but also to be able to position ourselves as um, a destination for fdi and through this government has really undertaken quite a number of reforms to make our business environment more attractive and it's partly due to the reason uh, why we see a lot of increase in, F, uh, in FDI despite the current situation uh, with the pandemic. Over the last um, 10 years, we've seen a significant increase in foreign direct investments, majorly in key sectors of our economy, you know, from energy uh, to infrastructure. We've seen real estate and construction taking a very you know, significant trend. And of course, tourism, which is also one of our biggest sources of foreign exchange to our economy. And, and the other thing that I also want to highlight is that because of this, uh, the increase has largely been attributed to, of course, the reforms undertaken by the government uh, through, for example, business registration. If you're a company that, you know, that is looking to do business in Rwanda, it's much more easier now to set up your, you know, incorporate your company without necessarily coming to Rwanda. We've been able to invest a lot in digitizing our services, you know, uh, and today, because of that, registering a company takes less than six hours. It's online and free of charge. So you don't need even to come to Rwanda for you to be able to register your, your business. And then secondly, we also have a one-stop center that provides numerous services. Uh, before 2008, uh, I would say that uh, doing business in Rwanda was a bit uh, cumbersome. But also, um, taking, take, uh, you also used to take a lot of time. But today, when you come to Rwanda, it's easier for you to get all services under one roof. And that place is none other than the Rwanda Development Board. So if you have a very strategic investment, whether in real estate and infrastructure, it's very easy for you to you know, get your project registered with us and then be able to get all the other services you know, from applying for a work permit, uh, you know, getting environmental impact assessment, because we believe that for you to be able to implement your project, at least must meet certain criteria uh, that are clearly articulated within our environmental law. And then the other aspects really are around aftercare services. We believe that for your investment to be able to thrive or succeed, how do we make sure that we handhold you and make sure that all the processes required, all the things that are required for your project to succeed, actually met and then not be able to go through um, uh, numerous problems so we have we also do provide that service within rdb making sure that if there is any issue that an investor you know uh, faces in a way we're there to help and make sure that that issue is addressed on time and then lastly is that we are also uh, in charge of negotiating strategic deals uh, on behalf of governments of rwanda a lot has been said uh, in terms of opportunities from industrial you know, parks development, you know, the projects related to energy mining. RDB has also been given that uh, important role of coordinating and making sure that all large investment projects, whether in infrastructure, are well coordinated, but at the same time structured in a way that will definitely bring value uh, to the economy. So if there is any strategic investment, whether in, in energy mining, um, you know, in, in, in ICT, we take that responsibility of making sure that we structure a deal that definitely brings value both to the government, but also to the investor. And of course, we've done a lot. Uh, we've worked a lot on so many projects um, um, uh, with the different ministries, with the Minister of Infrastructure, Minister of Finance, but also 
uh, you know, structuring deals that can, you know, be uh, implemented uh, in, the show, in, 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 a, in a given time. And then lastly, one other thing that I also want to highlight is the investment package or incentives. Because for any investor that is looking to invest in Rwanda, one of the things they'll look at is what is it going to, what, what return am I going to get on my investment? What facilitation am I going to get from the government of Rwanda? Uh, allow me to highlight some of the key important incentives that we're currently offering our invest, under our investment law for people to be able to understand uh, the incentives that we give. Today, our incentives are structured in a way that they're sector oriented because if we want to achieve uh, our ambitions, if we want to achieve our targets, we must be focused. And so definitely infrastructure is one of the areas that we're looking at. It's one of the key priority sectors. And so through this, we've been able to put in place several incentives, you know, ranging from, um, you know, a seven year corporate income tax holiday. If you're going to invest at least a minimum of 50 million US dollars with at least 30% uh, equity contribution, then you're likely to benefit from this seven year corporate income tax holiday. And of course, some of the key sectors that we're looking at uh, in terms of you know, facilitation, but also gaining from this incentive, of course, we're looking at energy. We're looking at manufacturing. My colleague already touched on uh, the industrial parks. And so for us to be able to attract more manufacturing-led investments, we must have at least uh, the right incentives that can help us to uh, bring in more uh, value-added investments within the manufacturing sector. Then others we're looking at, of course, ICT and, and ICT manufacturing and assembling. Uh, our goal is really to attract more proof of concept, you know, led investments. Today, Rwanda has one factory, uh, one investment called Marathons, which is actually from India. Today is the Pan-African company that is actually producing phones, but also, you know, selling to the domestic market. And their goal is really to roll out the expansion to the rest of the continent. And so if we can get more investments within the assembling uh, space, I believe that is going to add more value to the economy, both in terms of job creation, but also enhancing innovation and, and uh, within, within our eco, uh, eco technology space. So these are some of the areas that we're looking at. And definitely as, as an agency in charge of investment facilitation, we're always open to hear from new ideas that we can always develop on together and then be able to support both from the policy perspective, but also from the uh, facilitation perspective. And then lastly, we also have export um, oriented incentives because our goal again, as I mentioned, is really to see how we can substitute imports and then be able to make our economy more self-reliant, but even more sustainable in a way. And so today, um, if you're a company that is going to set up um, you know, a, a factory here and maybe venture into agro-processing or assembling, if you export at least 50% of your turnover goods, then we're able to reduce your uh, corporate income tax to 15% as opposed to paying um, 30%, which is almost a 50% reduction. And this incentive in itself has also been, you know, um, cascaded to other important uh, sectors of our economy. We're looking at energy distribution, uh, generation and transmission, from any of our key sources. Uh, you're looking at you know, um, hydro, uh, we're looking at peat, uh, methane, as well as uh, geothermal. And another key important element is of course, is an affordable housing. If we really want to realize affordable housing in Rwanda, then we must also be able to offer the right incentives that can help us attract uh, players within that segment. So if you're an investor that is going to invest in affordable housing, definitely one of the key most important incentive is of course the reduction of 15% corporate income tax, as well as the 50% uh, investment allowance uh, in your first year of operation. So in a nutshell, these are some of the areas that I wanted to highlight. I won't go so much into the opportunities. I think that has already been elaborated more. And as an agency in charge of investment facilitation, we're very much, we're always very open to uh, facilitate, share information, but also work with you through that investment journey to make sure that your investment uh, actually succeeds in a way uh, and, and, and making sure that it does provide the impact that it should be to the economy in general. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your insights on the business environment in Rwanda, particularly on digitalization and the one-stop shop available in Rwanda for investments. Uh, and now I will be moving over to Dipali 
for taking the next session on experience sharing. Over to you, Dupali. Thank you. Thank you, Sneha. Uh, this next session is on experience sharing session by the Indian project exporters. For this session, we have with us distinguished guests who represent the best of Indian industry. They are very senior business leaders who bring with them vast experience in doing business internationally and in particular in Africa. Uh, to begin the session, uh, I now call upon uh, Sri Akhil Gupta, Executive Director Operations uh, of Afcons Infrastructure Limited. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dipali. And good afternoon to the dignitaries, both from Rwanda and India, and also the delegates who are attending the webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, I represent uh, Afcons Infrastructure Limited. Uh, Afcons is part of Shapoji Palonji Group which is a large construction conglomerate. Afcons uh, has a, a very good experience of uh, uh, executing uh, projects of various types in several countries of uh, Africa. Currently, we are operating in about in 11 countries to be precise in Africa. And Shapoji Palonji Group, which is our holding company, operates in about 25 countries. Uh, while uh, FCONS has a, a very good portfolio of uh, projects in the field of highways and expressways, uh, railways, water supply, and marine projects. Our parent group uh, company has uh, excellent uh, spread across uh, 25 countries in the field of uh, uh, buildings, industries, and also power plants. Shaparji Palunji Group uh, company, SP Infra, has uh, a project called uh, a peat fired uh, power uh, project in Rwanda, which is 235 uh, megawatt plant, which we are currently implementing in Rwanda. Our experience in Rwanda has been excellent, and uh, we have actually never faced any problem in implementing this project. The support system from the government, from the waste stakeholders, has been excellent. I personally had the privilege of uh, visiting Kigali about two years ago when we had participated in Base Butaro Road project and had the uh, very pleasant experience of uh, being welcomed from the time I landed at the airport, wherein it doesn't take more than two minutes to get into the country. And uh, I am very pleased to share my experience uh, with the dignitaries from Rwanda that. I found Kigali as one of the most clean city, uh, at least in the developing world. It is extremely safe and I thoroughly enjoyed my stay there. And we had some very good meetings with the Ministry of Road Transport Development Authority. We, the project is still on hold and we are looking forward to, to execute this project where we are L1. And this tender was, this project was tenders just before Corona. And I, I understand that because of Corona, it has been put on hold. So overall, our experience of working in Rwanda has been quite good. And we are still looking forward very keenly for uh, executing projects in Rwanda. Apart from this road project, I also understand there is a large value railway project that is planned from Kigali to Isaka in Tanzania, where the Rwandan government wants uh, a communication channel to be established where they can take their goods directly to the Dar es Salaam port. So we are also looking at that a project as a big opportunity and we would be very, very keen to participate in that project. If I talk of our experience of uh, project exports in uh, Africa at large, uh, we have uh, actually been very successful in delivering the projects on time or ahead of schedule. Some of the large value projects, railway project in Ghana, the city decongestion project in uh, Zambia, Mozambique road project, marine projects across uh, various countries. The overall experience has been quite satisfying. When I say satisfying means we have been able to engage about 80 to 85 percent of the total manpower deployed on the projects from the country itself. Most of the local nations have been deployed and uh, our uh, relationship our ability to get the work from them in a very mutual respectful manner has been very, very high. We have also been able to uh, engage a lot of subcontractors 
as per the requirement of the local governments there are requirements of various governments wherein they want that 20 percent of the subcontracting should be given to the local subcontractors and we have been very successfully been able to implement those uh, requirements on the capacity building also we have been very very successful in terms of not apart from being able to uh, bring the key professionals uh, from the ministries to india engage them make them the industry visits etc we have also been able to successfully engage a lot of young engineers on our projects train them so that they can take up the responsibilities in their country as they grow in their infrastructure development overall the experience has been exceeding exceedingly good also i found that our csr activities which we have participated particularly in the health healthcare sector education sector have been very well received by the society at large and uh, we have been encouraged by them to contribute more and there have been instances when there have been floods we have been able to uh, take big responsibilities in taking care of the people who have been affected and supporting them uh, overall, uh, I feel Africa offers a great opportunity for uh, project exports from India. Uh, we uh, can have on mutual, mutually beneficial basis where we can uh, do a lot of um, capacity building for them, train their engineers, train their staff, and also transfer uh, technology from India to these countries. Overall experience has been uh, very good, I would like to say. It will be our endeavor to continue to see business for infrastructure development in uh, Rwanda as the times uh, uh, we look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now I may call upon Ashri Shantanu Roy, Executive Director of BEML Limited, uh, to please uh, address the webinar, sir. Excellencies, dignitaries, and my fellow esteemed speakers, I represent a company called BML Limited, formerly known as Bharat Hurt Movers Limited, which is a defense public sector undertaking under the Ministry of Defense, Department of Defense Production. The company came into existence in 1964, and we operate in three business verticals, defense and aerospace, rail and metro, and mining and construction. The defense and aerospace uh, business vertical we supply high mobility vehicles which are all terrain off-road floating axle to the indian armed forces and we have supplied more than 8000 such vehicles 300 trailers and wagons to the indian armed forces in the mining and construction sector we supply heavy earth moving equipment consisting of dump trucks excavators motor graders dozers wheel loaders pipe layers water sprinklers, rope shovels, and we have supplied more than 30,000 equipment all over India and all across the world. In the rail and metro sector, we manufacture rolling stock, that is the rail coaches, and where we have supplied more than 18,000 mainline passenger coaches to the Indian Railway, more than 700 numbers of mainline electric multiple units, and other rail equipment like the overhead inspection cars, utility vehicles, track laying equipment, in the metro sector, we have supplied more than 1,600 cars for different metro projects in India, Delhi, Calcutta, Jaipur, Bangalore, and presently we are executing the most prestigious Mumbai Metro Line 2 and Line 7, where we are, we are supplying 576 cars to MMRDA, involving the latest state-of-the-art three-phase propulsion system, regenerative braking, which leads to a lot of energy savings, TCMS, CBTC, fully automated, unmanned, trained, operated metro rolling stock, which is the first indigenously designed such kind of rolling stock in India. In the global market, we have been present since the last 40 years, and we have supplied more than 1,200 equipment to 68 countries. And I'm happy to share with you that Africa has a major share of this. More than 32% of our business has been done in Africa, in different countries, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Senegal, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Ghana, Libya, Sudan, Angola, and so on. 
in the rail sector we have exported passenger coaches to bangladesh and sri lanka and wagons to tanzania in the past we are committed to the united nations sustainable development goals sdg 7 that is affordable and clean energy sdg 11 sustainable cities and communities and sdg 13 that climate action and i'm happy to share with you that we as a company uh, we have 87 percent of our total energy usage through the renewable and clean energy and in 2019-20 we saved 24,037 tons of carbon and we as a company are fully committed to high technology including artificial intelligence and internet of things in our quest to acquire better technology and to give a thrust to honorable prime ministers make in india north Nirbhar initiatives we had embarked on an expression of interest to invite or leading OEMs, OEMs all across the world in the sectors of defense, aerospace, mining, construction, and the metro sector to partner with us to take forward the Indian manufacturing prowess. As a part of our Atmanirbhar efforts, we have had major successes in indigenization, having reached levels of more than 90% in the mining and construction, 74% in defense, and 60, more than 65% in rail metro sector. Uh, looking at Rwanda, and listening to the various eminent speakers, I can say that the agriculture and irrigation sector uh, offers us great opportunity to work in Rwanda. And I'm happy to share with you that uh, in Cameroon, we are on the verge of finalizing a contract, again funded by Government of India through Exim Bank of India under the lines of credit for a agriculture plantation project, mechanization of ag agriculture plantation project, wherein we are supplying various land clearing equipments like dozers, graders, and excavators. In the defense sector, the Ministry of Defense has come out with a defense production and export promotion policy under which the defense exports have to reach a target of $5 billion by 2024-25. And the government of India has recently announced a list of 152 products wherein which uh, India is ready to export to the Indian Ocean uh, region and to Africa. And I'm happy to share with you that out of these 30, 152 uh, products, 30 belong to the land systems, which are all BML products. In the rail and metro sector, I understand that Rwanda is coming up with the three new lines, one to Tanzania, the other to DR Congo, and the third one to Burundi. And uh, considering BML's prowess in the standard gauge, metro products, we can uh, be a part of not only the rapid rail urban transportation, which is being planned there, but also the mainline rail projects that are coming up. Let me share my experiences on the various flagship financing schemes of Exim Bank of India. To begin with, under the BCNEIA, among the various projects that we have executed, I would like to have a special mention of the Huangye Colliery Company Coal Mining Project in Zimbabwe, which BML executed with funding under BCNEIA from Exim Bank of India. And I must share with you that our experience has been a fantastic journey during this entire project. And with the help of Exim Bank of India, we were able to revive a dead investment of the government of Zimbabwe and help them in exporting coal through this project. Uh, I've been privileged to be associated with various other uh, financing projects of Exim Bank of India, especially under lines of credit. And in Rwanda, during my earliest stint with my previous company, I had the privilege of being associated with the 2 into 14 megawatt Nyabarongo hydro project, wherein we had supplied the electromechanical and the uh, mechanical uh, uh, and the hydromechanical packages for this power project. And I must express my extreme satisfaction uh, with the conditions in Rwanda and our overall experience of executing the project under the lines of credit with Exim Bank of India. I will take this opportunity to talk about another flagship financing scheme of Exim Bank of India, that is the concession financing scheme, which the government of India had brought out in 2015. And I'm happy to share with you that the only project that has been funded under, under this project was done by Exim Bank of India for a $2 billion USD, uh, $2 billion project in Bangladesh. 
and i am proud to be associated with that project as well it was one of the most satisfying projects uh, with financial closure uh, being done in a record time for such a huge project and uh, in that the borrowing entity was not the government under this scheme but it is the borrowing entity in that particular country which is uh, the owner of the project and it is aided by a sovereign guarantee from the borrowing entity maybe we can have some uh, other opportunity to talk about cfs more and uh, uh, after that project unfortunately no the project has been funded under cfs but uh, the government of rwanda can look into uh, cfs uh to cover any future infrastructure projects with the help of exim bank of india we as a company will be happy to partner rwanda in their further strides for growth and development along with exim bank through their various flagship programs of grant assistance and project finance thank you very much thank you very much sir uh we yeah, now call upon sri sanjeev agarwal executive director of international business pnd and solar kc international limited to address by sadanathis um his excellency is uh, uh the delegates from both the countries uh, my esteemed panelist and smart managers of exim thank you so much uh, for bringing me in uh, kc international has been associated with africa for more than two decades now uh, primarily uh, the job that we do is transmission distribution uh, substations uh, civil works and in railways uh, our association with uh, exim is again uh, uh, years together that we have worked the recent being uh, the railway project that we are trying to do in khana uh, let me come back and say what is what has been our experience with the uh, dealing uh, in rwanda and in more particular about africa uh, as i said we have been we have been uh, associated in this uh, continent for last two decades uh, we look forward to do more jobs the spirit of competitiveness the warmth of people and the hunger to say uh, we want to grow uh, brings us back every time whenever we see an opportunity uh, into the region i have lost the number of countries uh, that we are associated today in africa i mean both in both in east and west so i will not name them but you can pick up uh, any of the countries and you will find kc executing a job either on our transmission lines and thanks to madam shilpa you can see on the on the brochure she was trying to show there is uh, there is already a picture of a transmission line there so uh, look around you will see us uh, on transmission lines you will see us doing substations and uh, very soon you will see us doing uh, uh, railway projects in the country we are also we are also uh, getting excited by the indian ambassador statement about the hospitality industry i think the the civil this brings in lot of civil opportunity uh, particularly in rwanda and we will be looking for that uh, the rusma fall gitega brundi 161 km transmission line is the one uh, that we are executing uh, the the experience has been uh, fantastic the warmer as i said uh, brings brings us back into this country we have not seen an issue which someone will say you know uh, brings a break to an execution uh, one of one of the panelists talks about uh, Uh, and we can reiterate that second best place to do business in africa have a very high credit rating uh, you can register for any business uh, in 6 hours i mean this this is this is what an uh, entrepreneur will like to look at and we being an epc company would love uh, to do this business uh, in the country let me also talk uh, what is what is the future that we see particularly in rwanda uh, small country Uh, has presently an installed capacity of 218 megawatt of uh, power uh, which means uh, at this point in time with the population it's only 50% of the population who has an excess uh, to electricity uh, rwanda has this plan uh, called energy sector strategy plan going from 2019 to 2034 which which 
talks about uh, power to everyone. Uh, and when I see the projects being funded by World Bank, AFDBs, AFDs, and Exim, they are to the tune of uh, $700 billion as we speak uh, to be executed in transmission lines, substations uh, for the next 20 years. So the country uh, calls you back every time. Uh, the new projects uh, will help uh, uh, bring business uh, to the EPC contractors like us. And uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, let me also say what is that we give it back to the country. Uh, most of our, most of the population, uh, most of the people that we use uh, on safety, quality, and the local uh, contracting work, uh, we use we use the local population. Uh, this helps us uh, to train them. This helps. This also helps them to find an opportunity later on. You know, when people like us uh, go out. So uh, not making more of a time, I would say the experience has been fantastic and we look forward to work not only in Rwanda, but uh, throughout Africa. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. May I now call upon Sri Srinath Rao, Executive Vice President, uh, Africa, Larson and Tubro to kindly address them. Okay, very good afternoon, uh, excellencies, dignitaries, Ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, uh, I definitely would like to thank Exim Bank for giving us this opportunity to share our experiences as well as perspective in Africa. A quick brief about Larsen and Tubro. We are in existence for more than 70 years with a revenue in exceeding uh, 21 billion US, dollar com uh, US dollars. We are ranked 14th among the top 250 global contractors as rated by ENR. Uh, our market cap is in excess of 17 billion US dollars. Uh, we are basically, a, uh, the company a business portfolio basically consists of more than 50% of EPC business in all spheres. And uh, the balance comes from manufacturing, uh, information technology services, technology services, as well as financial services. Uh, we are present uh, in almost 11 to 12 countries in Africa, and 30% of our turnover comes from international business. Uh, coming to uh, East Africa and Rwanda in particular, Rwanda, a land of thousand hills, definitely has a breathtaking natural beauty and has a very aspirational vision 2050. Uh, we definitely see a very stable political scenario coupled with the young population. Its magnificent vision uh, is standing on five pillars and uh, people are at the helm of that. Uh, then the competitiveness, that is also quite a good thing to know about that it wants to be technologically and uh, innovative and provide a quality product. Agriculture is the thrust. Uh, where they really want to be, become the self-reliant uh, in agriculture and a robust public institution system. Uh, when we look at the uh, macro uh, indicators, we definitely find five or six sectors, as it is already mentioned by other dignitaries from Rwanda, to start with logistics, uh, healthcare infrastructure, power and water distribution, urbanization and education. Especially when we look at uh, health sector, we see that currently it has approximately 1.6 beds per thousand population. And whereas the WHO recommendations are three beds per thousand population. So we really do uh, agree that healthcare has a huge opportunity. And uh, LNT has proven credentials in all these segments. And we certainly can add value to the overall development of the country. Uh, we provide in healthcare, I'll, I'll just take uh, one minute or two minutes to explain that uh, expertise that we have. We have 30 years plus experience in healthcare. We provide expertise right from conceptual commissioning, and we have uh, commissioned in excess of 55 hospitals all across India and Gulf. Uh, we are currently executing a hospital project in Mauritius. I'm only naming some of the few which we are doing in, in, in outside India. We have recently also commissioned a cancer care center in Oman. 
few hospitals in Saudi Arabia and UAE. And also what LNT brings on the table is its unique state of the art in-house engineering capabilities, where we really add a lot of value add to the customers based on their requirement. In the sector of power transmission and distribution, we are quite active in Africa. Uh, to give you more thrust to African business, our power transmission distribution and water business is quite spread out in Africa, whereas other infrastructure and building uh, sectors are looking to enter into African region. Water supply projects, we are currently occupied in Tanzania as well as in a lot of Gulf countries. We have done unique landmark uh, infrastructure projects in Gulf, like Abu Dhabi Airport, quite a few uh, traffic decongestion programs in UAE, uh, cross-country expressways in Oman. We are also one of the unique companies uh, which has done uh, in excess of 2,000 track kilometers of freight corridors in India. Uh, we have also commissioned a light rail system in Mauritius. Just a few days back, we got the extension to that. Uh, we have also commissioned FIFA World Cup Stadium in Qatar. And also, uh, we were the EPC contractors for the world's largest stadium of 110,000 capacity in India. We are innovating ourselves. We are developing ourselves with a lot of push on digitalization. Our information technology division, as well as technology services division, add a lot of value to these initiatives that we do in India. Coming to the challenges in East Africa or Africa in general, uh, we have seen that uh, infrastructure funding is the major bottleneck. Sometimes we do uh, see skill set inadequacy. Majority of the countries which are landlocked, those require a lot of boost into rail and road infrastructure. And sometimes we also see some of the multiple regulatory requirements of various countries that creates some issues sometimes. Uh, the sovereign guarantee by the governments for uh, BCNIA projects is definitely one requirement that we need to look at. As LNT, what we bring on table is EPC design and build projects. We intend identifying priority projects, having the feasibility done. We want to look into, as I said, BCNIA uh, opportunities on EPC plus F model. As LNT, we bring one-stop solution to the employer for the timely and cost-effective delivery. We certainly maximize the engagement of local manpower and their skill upgradation. And we do bring key personnel from our core team with, from India. And always the thrust is on utilization of the local supply chain. In conclusion, I would like to say reliability is the other name of LNT. And we bring in safety, quality, timely delivery for the benefit of our customer. Thank you very much. I'm extremely sorry that I could not show you my presentation, which actually I have gone through and explained to you now. But uh, I will see if I can uh, forward this presentation to the bank for passing it on to August. Thank you very much for your patience. Sure, sir. Thank you so much. Um, now I call upon Shreya Arijit Datta Chaudhary, sir, uh, Vice President uh, and Head in International Operations, Ashok Leyland Limited. Kindly, if you could uh, address uh, the webinar. Uh, good afternoon, honorable dignitaries and distinguished uh, panelists. I hope I made it. Yes, sir. Please go Thank ahead, you, sir. Thank you very much. And a warm good afternoon to all the participants from the land of the male colonists. First of all, uh, thank you to Exim Bank of India for giving us this opportunity to share our experiences. Our esteemed panelists have been doing this. But uh, I'll take a quick minute to introduce myself and the organization that I work for. My name is Arjit Dutta Chaudhuri. I am the Vice President of Ashok Leland. I'm also the head of the International Operations. Ashok Leland, as you know, is the flagship of the Hinduja Group, the second largest manufacturer of commercial vehicles in India. Is the largest bus and third largest bus manufacturer in the world and the tenth largest manufacturer of the trucks. Current turnover of around four billion dollars and a footprint of across uh, across 50 countries. We are we are one of the most fully integrated forward and backward uh, companies in the auto sector in the world. 
We are the first automotive sector outside uh, Japan to have actually won the Deming Award, which if you know is equivalent to an Oscar in the automotive world or the manufacturing world. Uh, quickly, I'd like to take you through uh, to the relevance of the session, which is sharing our experiences of the projects that we have done in Africa. We currently operate in 28 countries in Africa uh, with a major presence. And all those 28 countries, our entry has been significantly through this project routes and supported by the Government of India Lines of Credit and the BCNEI Lines of Credit, which has been so very prominently being talked about, which is the flagship scheme of the Ministry of Commerce and very well executed by Exit Bank of India. Uh, just to tell you briefly, we have executed projects of the rapid bus transport in Lagos, which was the first ever BRT in Africa. This was done in 2008. We have done around the 1,000 bus project in Angola, so the first 4 by 4 buses that we have seen in the world. We have done the intercity metro buses in Ghana. We have done waste management trucks in Ghana. We have done the project for the military vehicles in Tanzania, a glimpse of which was already shown by the Shilpa. Uh, we have also done the major transport rehabilitation project in the city of Dakar, called the Dakar uh, of which also you have seen the glimpse. We have done a major project with the Ministry of Tourism in Zimbabwe, Republic of Congo, and uh, one of the major flagship projects that was done in uh, Ivory Coast for the supply of 832 vehicles. And this project is likely to be extended for another 2,000 vehicles. Uh, just to take you through a couple of these projects to give you a flavor of what these projects mean uh, for the countries, because it's difficult to elaborate all of them. The first one was the DRT project in Africa, which was the first of its kind in Africa. This was the first project that Ashok Gelan embarked upon under the initiative of the lines of credit uh, on a public transport, uh, public private uh, uh, partnership mode also. So, what we did was we gathered individual private operators in Lagos and brought them under one structured body. And then uh, we created the feasibility of the project as well as the financing, enabling the local uh, banks to finance the infrastructure and government of India to finance the uh, project with the buses. And Ashok Leland became the supplier of the buses and not just the supplier of the buses, but the entire integrated solutions, which means from the designing of the buses, designing of the roads, uh, to actually implementing the uh, organization of the roads, implementing the organizers, the transporters, and the maintenance of the product for five years before we hand it over to uh, the local team. Uh, of course, it entailed a huge amount of local employment. The proof of this project uh, becoming sustainable is evident with the project still running after uh, 12 years of its implementation. And today there are more than 16 companies participating in this project, not just a show period ago, including many of the global companies. The next project of interest would be the FDDR project in Ivory Coast, which was funded by Exim Bank of India under the NEIS scheme. Uh, this was another initiative uh, from the government of uh, for the world, where Ashok Lennon got involved to do the entire feasibility with the help of the Exim's local team. And this was the first time that, uh, you know, the initiative of the government was to reach the public transport to the masses and especially to the areas because they had a lot of uh, uh, products which were being built in Ivory Coast, but from the lack of transport were not able to be transported. Like, for example, they had a lot of cocoa produce, and at the right time of the season, if you go to cocoa, it would not be transported. They actually ran to get uh, rotten. And this was the project, therefore, empowering a lot of individual owners to get into this business. Uh, this uh, project is on a 12 year uh, demo at a subsidized rate, as you all know. And uh, the benefits of all of this project has also been passed on to the operators. On the backdrop of this project, Ashok Lenin also and this has set and also has set up a uh, one class training facility in Ivory Coast. Uh, many of our colleagues from the Bank of India has visited and experienced that. Uh, we have trained more than 1,600 operators in that country. Uh, this first time uh, operations of this scale has uh, taken place in any African country. We run our full fledged warehouse, and as we move along, Ashok Yemen has just committed to build up uh, an assembly plant in the country to cater to the future demand that Exim Bank and Ashok Land is working together with the government of Ivory Coast to fulfill. The third project that I would like to love to elaborate is the Dakar Dempi project in Senegal. Uh, it's a company which was uh, under the dole drops, if I may say, and were making losses. 
uh, their buses were stopped by them uh, because they were not able to operate these buses because of lack of spare parts, adequate knowledge of operations. For the first time in the history, this project was uh, done in the year 2015. It is now five years uh, that the project has operated in this country. This project saw an integrated approach, right from building up of their workshop, rehabilitating their entire facility, creating depots and training center within their uh, facilities, designing the buses, uh, first time uh, buses which were low floor, low in floor in nature, uh, providing them a ticketing solution, connecting them to the banks and the depots. Uh, therefore, therefore, bringing transparency to the entire operational system, which now helps uh, the entire government to understand that uh, what is the profitability of the entire project. If you, if I may add, this is one of the project uh, running there for six percent with ninety-five percent uptime, which was recently been experienced by the team also. Uh, never before in Africa has any transport project run with ninety-five percent uptime. Now this project has run for six years now with a 95% uptime, and I'm glad to say that of 475 buses, 463 buses are on road as on date, which means more than 90% buses of the fleet are being utilized. More than 95% of the time of this fleet is being utilized on the road, therefore uh, getting the desired revenue and the ticketing is coupled to the ticketing system and the robust integrated feedback of uh, training and after sales. I'm sure as you would be able to validate that the payment mechanism has been extremely smooth. What is common between all this project is an integrated approach that uh, we take to work along with the operators, to work along with the government, and create the end-to-end -end integrated solution. Now, when I say end-to-end, -end, what we mean is that we just don't look at the supply of the buses. We look at supply of the buses, building local capacities like training centers, workshops. Uh, we look at uh, long term after sales. We look at uh, managing the entire fleet over the period of the life cycle. We create the infrastructure of the artificial intelligence and the ticketing to connect uh, them to the uh, low, uh, to the banks and to the government agencies to ensure that there is enough amount of accountability when it comes to managing the operations uh, physically as well as the managing the operations financially. This amount of transparency has given a lot of confidence to the governments who are actually involved in providing the sovereign guarantee, which is a prerequisite for any of this kind of financing, which all my co-panelists have just spoken about. So these projects have essentially brought enough amount of accountability and transparency that the government has started to trust. We believe that the Rwandan government, which is already in the forefront of uh, leading the African economy, as well as the transparency mechanism, would see a lot of uh, value in what we offer. What I believe uh, the way forward with all our experience is that there's a latent demand of organized public transportation system in Africa, including Rwanda. And this is amplified by the fact that the population and the economic growth is taking place across Africa. Of course, because of the pandemic, we might see a slight slowdown, but this does not take away the hunger of people moving from one place to another. And the more the efficient and the innovative the solutions are, this helps address the problems of transportation, which are the engine to the economic growth on a longer term. Every country has got its own challenges in whatever projects that is being exhibited. While the Indian manufacturer, or being an Indian manufacturer, we are ready to share these experiences and knowledge from our home country, as well as wherever we have done this project. There are risks associated, and our experiences would well complement and supplement your efforts of mitigating this risk that might arise during implementation of this project. And I thank the Gym Bank of India for giving us this platform for sharing so that our friends from Rwanda could experience also that, you know, these companies have adequate uh, resources, they have adequate knowledge, and they have adequate experience of handling projects in and around Africa. And their risks are very minimal as far as this uh, exhibition of these projects are concerned. On the government standpoint, any transportation project should not only be seen as by the return of investment being made, but also the overall impact it has on the welfare of the people. Because uh, most of the countries are still social, socialist in nature and they depend on the government to provide them the basic amenities. Creating and running of such sustainable projects in the country will create confidence in the private lending institutions like the Bank of India, which offers this kind of flagship schemes. So this is our experience in a nutshell, and we had a great working relationship with Exim Bank of India and whichever governments we have worked uh, so far. Uh, with this, I would like to stop and make sure that we still remember the time. Thank you very much uh, for everyone listening to me. Thank you very much, sir. Sorry, there was.
unmuting my mic. Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, input. Um, actually, the next speaker was Mr. Dinesh Madhavan uh, from Apollo Hospital Enterprises Limited, but uh, we understand that he's unable to join the call uh, at this moment. So we will move on to the last session. That's a Q&A session. Uh, Snehal, will you please take this over? Yeah, thank you, Dipali. Uh, we begin with a Q&A session, but we are already overshooting time. So in the interest of time, we'll be just taking a few questions. For any more questions, we request all the participants to email it to us. We shall, after this webinar, we shall be sending you an email. You all may reply to that email with your questions. We will certainly get back to you with our answers. The first question is uh, to Mr. Gerald Mugabe, Ministry of Finance. Uh, this question is from Mr. Swaminathan from GMC Projects India. His question is, is there a centralized list of priority infrastructure projects with the Ministry of Finance approved by the respective ministries for which government is looking for EPG pro proposals under project funding? Uh, thank you for uh, for that question. Yeah, I, I, this one is something that we can work. Uh, priorities change time by time, but we can work with the uh, uh, with the anyone interested to identify priority projects in the, in infrastructure, in roads, in electricity, water, and of course, working with the Ministry of Infrastructure. So this is something that we can do. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next question is uh, by Mr. Shashank Govindraj. This is to the Rwandan Development Board. Uh, Mr. Philip, Mr. Philip Lucky, if you could just respond to this question. The question is, uh, is there a full country report of Rwanda with all details on key areas of opportunities in infrastructure in Rwanda? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, we do. yes, yes, we do. We have a very detailed pitch um, showcasing investment opportunities uh, within the infrastructure sector. Unfortunately, due to the time constraint, we're unable to present, but we're happy to send you the information and perhaps relate uh, uh, to the participants and, and maybe we can carry on the conversation uh, when they've received the information. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next question is to Mr. Zaki Yamake from Ministry of Health. The question is by uh, Mr. Gorish from Iron Exchange. The question is whom to connect with regards to water treatment and sanitation treatment projects in Rwanda? Thank you very much. Um, uh, water and sanitation uh, in Rwanda is the responsibility of uh, the Minister of Infrastructure. So the Permanent Secretary of the Minister of Infrastructure, uh, because they have uh, uh, the transport sector, uh, energy sector, as well as the water sector that they are managing. So water and sanitation is uh, the responsibility of the Minister of, uh, of uh, Infrastructure primary. But of course, we work with them when it comes to uh, the, the sanitation part of it and ensuring that uh, uh, environmental health is uh, as well as respected. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I'm, I am extremely sorry to all the participants because we are overshooting time. So uh, we will be closing the Q&A session. We look forward to your question and answers to us, which we will be directly responding to you all. I now call upon Mr. Sunil Rajguru, a resident representative at our Addis Ababa office representing East Africa to give the closing remarks. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you so very much. Uh, good afternoon, excellencies and uh, honorable dignitaries. Uh, as all good things have to come to an end, we have to end this session now. Uh, 
to put our thanks uh, let me first uh, uh, thank you our dmd sir for setting the tone uh, of today's webinar and uh, your continued guidance and encouragement which motivates us to organize such interactive sessions which is part of india exam bank's series of outreach programs with partner countries explaining them about various financing options that india exam bank can offer for promoting investment and development of partner countries in africa asia latin america uh, caribbean sierra leone region thank you very much sir we also thank honorable uh, shri amitab kumar sir for graciously agreeing to honor the occasion for sharing with us various initiatives promoted by government of india for sharing india's developmental experience with various partner countries across the globe thank you sir for your address we also thank the indian high commission in rwanda and the rwandan high commission in india for their support in organizing today's event without which it would not have been possible we thank uh, your excellency mr oscar karakata for sharing his views and bringing to the table various opportunities that are available to indian companies in rwanda sir your proposal for setting up of a, a multi speciality hospital in rwanda truly reflects on your vision to promote india rwanda partnership for undertaking projects that are of social importance to the government of rwanda indian companies in healthcare sector i'm sure that uh, indian indian companies in healthcare sector have taken note of the same and soon we'll have some concrete proposal uh, in this um, uh, connection with and we will we, we, we will do uh, consult uh, with the minister of health government government of rwanda to take this uh, proposal forward thank you very much sir we also thank uh, her excellency ambassador of jacqueline uh, makanga for her support for the webinar and uh, mr ml uh, mr ml the second counselor hci of rwanda in india for his as for his address and sharing rwandan embassy's views on the india rwanda partnership we also thank madam shilpa wagmare uh, general manager bcni group india exim bank for taking us uh, through the comprehensive presentation thank you madam we extend our heartful thanks uh, to the excellencies his excellency uh, mr zaki and um, uh, her excellency uh, ms patrice wase for highlighting various areas of opportunities and cooperation which can be explored by indian companies for uh, mutual uh, growth thank you so very much excellencies we also thank uh, mr jonas uh, mr uh, gerald mugabe and mr phil of lucky for sharing us uh, the uh, and, and highlighting uh, the business environment uh, in rwanda which is which is uh, conducive for the indian investors thank you so much uh, we also thank uh, the representatives of the indian business community who will be the actual driving force behind all these initiatives uh, to and, and and also to sharing their experiences Uh, Sri uh, Akhil Gupta, uh, Executive Director, Afcons Infrastructure Limited; Sri Shantanura, Executive Director, BML Limited; Sri Sanjeev Agarwal, Executive Director, uh, um, Case International Limited; uh, Sri Shrinath Rao, Executive Vice President, Elanti; Sri Arijit Datta, Vice President, Ashok Leyland Limited. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we also thank the CCG team uh, for their wonderful coordination and arrangement for the webinar. i request all the participants in case you have any queries you can email us at ccg@exambankindia.in or aaro@exambankindia.in and we'll certainly get back to you for clarifications uh, for all your queries thank you so very much everyone